Hi, my name is Dr. Robert Groisman, and last week we talked about deep sleep and how that can affect uh, long COVID uh, recovery. This week I want to discuss how to avoid insomnia in general uh, as it pertains to long COVID. Uh, insomnia is a very common symptom found in long COVID. So what is exam insomnia? It, it can involve uh, problems falling asleep. It can involve problems staying asleep. And it can involve uh, problems with disrupted sleep. That is, you're waking up multiple times during the night, uh, and then you fall back asleep. Uh, what are some of the causes of insomnia? Uh, one of the most common ones um, is anxiety and stress. Uh, things that bother you during the day translate to uh, your brain working at it at night and you have trouble falling asleep due to worrying um, or anxiety. Um, shift work, that has to do more with circadian rhythms where you're falling asleep at different times of the day. Uh, depression, uh, believe it or not, can lead to insomnia, uh, both uh, falling asleep and staying asleep. Alcohol is one of the biggest culprits, especially if, um, if, uh, if taken at night. Um, caffeine after 5 p.m. can lead to problems falling asleep or staying asleep. It is a stimulant. It's a neurostimulant. Um, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to, keeping you awake. Uh, and the last thing is uh, just a poor sleep environment, uh, either a bad mattress, a lumpy old mattress, uh, springs you know, kind of going up into your back, bad pillow or uncomfortable pillow, uh, the temperature in the room, either being too hot or too cold, the, the bedroom just being noisy. And finally, light. Uh, everybody knows about light pollution uh, because of all the electronics that we have these days. So let's talk about good sleep hygiene. So um, to keep your circadian rhythm on track, uh, it's best to go to bed and wake up the same time each and every morning, Monday through Friday, but also Saturday and Sunday. Um, if you do that, your circadian rhythm is going to keep step and allow you to fall asleep when you want to uh, at the same time each night. Light pollution. So thanks to all the electronics and lights and, and gadgets, uh, there's a lot of light uh, present in the bedroom, even if you're not aware of it. Our electronics uh, give off a certain amount of light from LEDs. Uh, if it's possible, try to put those away in drawers and hide them. Uh, the most particularly troublesome one is blue light. Uh, the one that's between 450 and 470 nanometers. So why that particular problem with blue light? It can reset your circadian rhythm. If you're exposed to this light during the day before 11 a.m., and I'm talking about direct exposure, not through glass, not through glasses, but direct exposure to this frequency of light, your circadian rhythm will reset so that by the time you're ready to go to sleep, melatonin will be, will be produced by the pineal gland at the right time, and you will fall asleep uh, promptly. If you are exposed to this blue light at night, and uh, guess, guess where it comes from? TV, computers, laptops, your phone. A lot of appliances have blue LEDs as uh, indicator lights. Uh, if you are exposed to this light uh, around nighttime or when you're ready to go to bed, your body thinks it's it's time it's time for morning. It's everything is going to be reset. It's going to mess up your circadian rhythm, and you're going to have a really hard time falling asleep and staying asleep. Uh, lowering the room temperature. Um, if your room is too hot or too cold, um, it, you're going to have a really hard time falling and staying asleep. So we, we mentioned the TVs, the laptops, the phones, and uh, other electronics, and that mainly pertains to the blue light that these devices emit. Alcohol and caffeine, two of the biggest um, troublemakers, nightcaps. Um, try to avoid both caffeine and alcohol if you want to have a good night's sleep. Um, meals. So most people should be eating three meals a day. Uh, the last meal should be the lightest meal of the day. Um, you know, there's an old saying stating that you should eat, breakfast should be eaten like a king and um, 
lunch should be eaten like a prince and uh, dinner should be eaten like a pauper. Uh, the reason is, is because you want, you want the food to have time to digest uh, during the day. And um, by eating a heavy dinner, uh, you may have trouble falling asleep. Um, things like exercising during the day, not, not right before bed, but during the day will help prepare your body circadian rhythm into falling asleep when you need to fall asleep. So with insomnia, specifically in long COVID, the main mechanism is sympathetic activation. That means the sympathetic nervous system is working overtime. It creates a lot of epinephrine in your system. Um, your heart rate is faster. You're breathing faster. You have anxiety. You have issues um, from this by, by not being able to experience deep sleep. Or if you do experience deep sleep, it's very short. Because of that, there, there, it, it actually may look like brain fog and fatigue just from uh, cumulative uh, insomnia. So what does it look like um, when, uh, when you haven't slept well, the symptoms of insomnia? Well, you're going to be sleepy and you're going to be tired. You're going to be irritable. You're going to be crabby. You're not going to be a nice person. Um, you're going to be anxious, and you're going to have a difficulty focusing or remembering memory issues. What does this sound like? This sounds like brain fog. This sounds like fatigue. So are the symptoms of chronic fatigue and brain fog a result of insomnia, or are there separate symptoms of long COVID? I don't know. Sleep debt. So this is a, a big problem because your body needs a certain amount of sleep each and every um, each and every day. And if you don't get the sleep you need or your body needs, um, it's added to a counter. Um, and each day that you miss those hours of sleep, it accumulates. Uh, it's a cumulative system and it's progressive. You're going to feel worse and worse and worse. It's going to not just impact your brain, but also your entire body function. You're going to become sluggish. You won't be able to remember things. Um, you're going to have a really hard time thinking and forming and um, focusing on, on tasks. When you do make up the time, it's not one night. It's not two nights. You really need to spend uh, a prolonged amount of time making up uh, the sleep. And what your body is going to do during that time is you're going to be spending a lot more time in deep sleep to recover from the sleep debt. So that's very important that recovery from sleep debt takes time. It's not going to be a quick process. So what are some agents that can help with sleep? Uh, the agents that I'm going to be mentioning are non-habit forming uh, and non-addicting and will not leave you groggy or drowsy when you wake up. So the first candidate would be melatonin. It is a natural hormone. It is produced by the pineal gland of the brain. It's a small um, raisin-sized gland that sits uh, in, in the bottom of the brain and it produces uh, melatonin when you, when you are exposed to darkness. So this is one of those few things where um, light exposure can change the expression of melatonin. So this goes back to the blue light exposure uh, during good sleep habits. Um, if your brain is getting ready to sleep and is starting to produce melatonin and you expose it to blue light, you expose it through your eyes to blue light, um, it's going to stop the melatonin production and your body's going to become very confused. Melatonin is very, very important in controlling uh, and regulating your circadian rhythm. That's what sets when things happen each and every day. And there's another kind of a neat feature of melatonin is anti-inflammatory. The next agent is called DSIP. It is a peptide. It is called a deep sleep inducing peptide. Uh, it is available in an injectable state. It's injected similarly to how insulin is injected into the subcutaneous tissue. What's important about this uh, is that it induces delta wave brain activity in the brain. 
So it's not a sedative, neither is melatonin, neither one of them actually sedate you. They help induce sleep. So this is found normally, this uh, peptide is found normally in several areas of the brain, including the hypothalamus, but we are not sure exactly where it's made yet. And it has an effect on body temperature. If you're always feeling cold, for instance, it can help regulate the temperature back up. This particular medication is the only FDA-approved non-sedative that uh, is not habit-forming again. Um, it is prescription, and it works again through melatonin recept receptor activation. Uh, it is about 10 times more potent than melatonin that you would buy over the counter. It is not melatonin itself, but it activates these receptors. It helps you fall asleep and stay asleep. Uh, and uh, helps you regulate the sleep-wake um, cycle. So uh, what's, uh, what's um, interesting about this medication is, is it's not a sedative, okay? So that's important to know that there's no hangover or um, anything after you wake up. And it helps you sleep between six to eight hours. So now we're going to get to some of the sedatives. So sedatives basically make you sleepy. Some of the most common ones are antihistamines like, um, like Benadryl or Dephenhydramine. Um, you are aware of um, benzodiazepines and barbiturates. And of course, most people know of um, medications like Ambien or Lunesta. Uh, now, those are non-benzodiazepine sedatives. And then there's a uh, herbal one called valerian, uh, which has quite a equivocal studies. It works for me. It may not work for you. It um, it works for some, but not others. Um, a lot of these are habit forming. Uh, for instance, antihistamines are, may not be habit forming, but the problem with them is is that the effectiveness decreases every time you use it. So if you are using it every night, you will notice that the sedative effect will dissipate over time. The benzodiazepines and barbiturates have several side effects, um, including disrupting REM sleep and creating a hangover when you wake up. And the non-benzo, uh, but non-benzodiazepine medications uh, can potentially um, lead to sleepwalking, sleep driving, and very, very vivid dreams. Um, the problem with, with sedatives is sometimes even though you're asleep, you're not getting a restful night and therefore you don't wake up rested. Um, that's all I have about um, insomnia and, um, and long COVID and sleep. I hope uh, this has been helpful. Thank you.